In the reign of Augustus, there were at the eastern edge of the Roman Empire a number of client kingdoms. Of the kings of these, it is Herod of Judea who is the best remembered, through both the Gospel of Matthew and the works of Josephus. But still extant in Israel today, the most eloquent testimony to this extraordinary man and the best evidence of the forces at work on and within him are the remains of the great building program he undertook. In the north, he rebuilt two cities. Of Caesarea, Josephus wrote, he noticed on the coast a town called Strato's Tower. He rebuilt it entirely with limestone and adorned it with a most splendid palace. He constructed a harbour bigger than the Piraeus. On rising ground opposite the harbour mouth stood Caesar's temple of exceptional size and beauty. Little remains of this splendour. He also built this much restored theatre and a hippodrome. But it's the aqueduct that illustrates the impact of Greco-Roman urban development on the landscape of Judea. It is in fact a double aqueduct. The nearer arch is later, but the further arch is Herodian. Five miles of aqueduct still stands, and it stretches away towards Mount Carmel in the north. The other rebuilt city, Sebaste, was Samaria, the capital of the ancient northern kingdom of Israel, destroyed by the Assyrians in 721 BC. Herod renamed it from the Greek Sebastos Augustus. Much of what we see is of later construction, but the round towers are Hellenistic, incorporated in the newer walls. Josephus says that Sebaste was to be a fortress against the people. He settled in it mercenaries and non-Jews from the surrounding area. And in the centre of the new town created a vast shrine dedicated to Augustus. The precincts were 300 yards in length. In the retaining walls there are courses of masonry from the time of the kings of Israel. And above we see the first rather warm examples of the finely cut masonry of Herod's time. Herod also allotted the settlers some land of excellent quality. At Samaria, as at Caesarea, we see Herod looking towards Rome, showing his loyalty to Augustus. He was also creating cities with pagan temples and Greek constitutions, and providing himself with a reserve of Gentile manpower for internal security. In two places, Jerusalem and Hebron, Herod put his desire for prestige and glory to the service of the Jewish religion to which his people had been converted some generations earlier. Nothing now remains of the temple itself, but we can see very clearly the huge platform Herod built. At the southern end is the grey dome of the Aksa Mosque. On the centre of the platform, on the site of the temple itself, is the dome of the rock. At the north end is the site of Herod's Antonia Tower, of which there are no definite remains. At the southeast corner is the pinnacle of the temple, 
from which, according to Christian tradition, James, the brother of Jesus, was thrown. Here we can clearly see the beautifully cut Herodian blocks. Above, the masonry is decayed, and above that is the inferior masonry of later builders. On top of this southern wall stood the magnificent two-story Royal Basilica with its row of columns. Some of them were reused below. Beneath the Axo Mosque is this stairway, parts of which are original. It led from the temple above to the city below. By its side are a number of ritual baths, mikvahot. People step down into them before going up into the temple area. The steps led to the gates in the southern wall, through which people passed on their way up to the temple. The triple gate and the double gate, part of the lintel of which is visible in the shadow of a medieval building. Behind this walled up gate, and in a rather disfigured condition, are the original Herodian passageways and steps leading to an exit on the temple platform. This Herodian ceiling boss is an impressive remnant. The place of trumpeting, where the onset of each Sabbath was announced to the people of the city, is above the southwest corner. A Herodian street runs along the south wall. To the left, the beginning of the street, running northward, is also visible. Above that street is the springing of what is called Robinson's Arch. It was in fact a stairway which descended to street level through two left turns. It is here, among the extensive excavations, that one can see the massive Herodian stones thrown down by the Romans in 70 AD from the top of the walls. This, literally, was the destruction of the temple. Since that calamitous event, Orthodox Jews have worshipped at a point northward on the western side, traditionally called the Wailing Wall, of which the lower seven courses are Herodian. Because of its proximity to the site of the Holy of Holies, it's a place of special significance to the Jewish people. Beside the wall is a row of medieval arches, which carry the causeway directly onto the temple court. Within, the largest arch is Herodian in its lower courses and springs directly from the western wall and now serves as the ceiling of a synagogue. The later rebuilt upper section must follow the original arch very closely. Herod's temple and temple court and its enormous substructure rivaled in scale the grandest projects of Augustus himself but only its base remains. There is, though, a building which gives us an impression of what it was like. This is the tomb of the patriarchs, built over the cave of Mark Pela at Hebron. Josephus describes it, their tombs are shown in the little town to this day, of really fine marble and of exquisite workmanship. In AD 333, a Christian pilgrim wrote, a remarkably beautiful tomb on which are laid Abraham, Israel, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca and Leah. The Crusader church inside provides a roof. It now serves as a mosque. And inside that is a small synagogue. It's approximately 30 by 60 yards, a much smaller construction than the temple. But the higher levels of the building, with stones laid in flat pilasters, is our best evidence for what the outer walls of the temple court looked like.
the masonry is well preserved and exhibits the delicate and classically severe workmanship of Herod's time. So far as we know, this tomb and the temple were Herod's only religious architecture. His most characteristic buildings were palaces and fortresses, typically on hilltop sites overlooking the Dead Sea or Jordan Valley, like these four. Two others we shall look at later. There was also the Winter Palace of Jericho, and then the Great Palace in the upper city of Jerusalem covering about four and a half acres, known only from Josephus' description, which was used to build this model. Its magnificence and equipment were unsurpassable, surrounded as it was on every side by a wall 45 feet high, with ornamental towers evenly spaced along it. The open spaces were all green lawns. It was everywhere plentifully adorned with bronze statues. Set into the city wall a little to the north were three towers superior in size, beauty and strength to any in the whole world. This is the sole survivor. It conforms to Josephus' description being solid at the base with a vast cistern above and with chambers above that. Like the others, it was both a fortress and a luxurious palace. So too was Masada, towering above the Dead Sea. There was already a fortress here, built by Jonathan Maccabeus in the 2nd century BC. But it was entirely reconstructed by Herod as early as the 30s BC as a fortress against Cleopatra of Egypt and also against the Jewish people. An aerial view of the excavations confirms Josephus that a wall, originally with towers, was built all round the cliff edge. Much of the top was used for cultivation. The area is large, about 600 yards north to south and a maximum of 300 yards west to east. There were groups of buildings on the west side, on the north tip of the plateau, and on a series of steps descending down from there. It was thus, first of all, a fortress. From below, from almost any angle, it appears totally impregnable. When it was occupied in the Great Jewish Revolt of A.D. 66 to A.D. 74 by the resistance group known as the Sicarii, they found stores of food laid down in Herod's time and arms sufficient for 10,000 men. There is also a vast series of systems for collecting rainwater. This is one of the largest near the south end of the plateau. It is hollowed out in the rock and reached by a long flight of steps. Two further holes in the rock gave light and allowed more rainwater to flow in. But it wasn't just a functional military establishment. Here, among the buildings on the upper plateau of the northern palace, is a standard example of a Greco-Roman bathhouse. But the most brilliantly original architectural features are these three luxurious public rooms, which occupy the northernmost end of the plateau. The highest level is a semicircular balcony attached to the rest of the palace complex on the plateau. On the terrace below is a round room projecting out over the vertical rock and resting on two concentric circular walls. It joins a pillared hall built against the rock face and was linked to the upper terrace by a stairway. Forty-five feet below is a square terrace built out over the cliff on supporting walls. 
The central area was surrounded by a portico with columns. Here there is a particularly well-preserved decorative wall plaster on the rock face which formed the south side of the hall. The exact functions of these rooms cannot be certain. All that is obvious is that they were intended for pleasure, designed to take advantage of the view of the Dead Sea and eastward to the hills of Moab, and had no practical military purpose. Representing, as they do, the introduction of refined urban domestic architecture into a spectacular desert landscape, they must be regarded as among the most original and striking architectural achievements from the ancient world. If Masada is much the best known of Herod's palaces, the last few years have seen the uncovering of remarkable palace buildings, southwest of Jericho, not a hilltop side this time. These have the particular interest that it was here that Herod spent the last few days of his life, and here that he died in 4 BC. This palace was not a fortress. It lay on ground sloping down towards the fertile plain beside the Jordan. According to Josephus, it was between Mount Kypros and the former palace of the Hasmonean kings that Herod built another palace on both banks of the Wadi Kelt, finer and better equipped for his periods of residence, and named two parts of it after Augustus and Agrippa. Excavations of the site are continuing in the shadow of Mount Kypros, where Herod had another of his hilltop fortresses. Northwards, we can see an extensive building on the plateau above the steep slope down to the wadi. It had a suite of luxurious public rooms. These included a bathhouse and a large reception hall. This room had a particularly elaborate structure. There is some well-preserved opus reticulatum, the network pattern of bricks so characteristic of contemporary Rome. Given its much less spectacular location and its construction in mud brick and concrete, this site can hardly now convey its original grandeur or luxury. In order to imagine that, it may be well to remind ourselves of the reconstruction of the palace in Jerusalem, two parts of which were also named after Augustus and Agrippa. Nearby at Tel Es Samrat, there was a small mud brick theater adjacent to an amphitheater. The oval outline of the complex is visible in the paths of an Arab farm. It was in this amphitheater, a few days before his death, that Herod ordered leading men from all over Judea to assemble. He then had them locked in with orders that if he should die, they should all be killed, so that universal mourning would not fail to follow his death. In fact, few mourned Herod. His body was taken to Herodion, the last of his palace fortresses. Josephus described it this fortress, which is eight miles from Jerusalem, is naturally strong and very suitable for such a structure. For reasonably nearby is a hill raised to a greater height by the hand of man and rounded off in the shape of a breast. It has a steep ascent formed of 200 steps of hewn stone. Within it are costly royal apartments made for security and for ornament at the same time.
there were four towers on the perimeter surrounding the palace. Of these towers, the eastern is the best preserved. From the top, we look east over the Judean desert to the Dead Sea and the hills of Moab, and northeast almost to Bethlehem and Jerusalem. Through the main gate to the courtyard is the garden with a peristyle around it. Beyond is the triclinium, or dining room, surrounded by smaller rooms. On the other side of the peristyle is a bathhouse. The tepidarium is well preserved. It's made, like the rest of the palace, of stone and has an elegant and very early domed roof. There was also a lower city of considerable elegance. Round the base he built other royal apartments to accommodate his furniture and his friends, so that in its completeness the stronghold was a town in its compactness, a palace. When Herod died, the Jews held in the amphitheater at Jericho were released. Josephus described the funeral procession. There was a solid gold bier adorned with precious stones and draped with the richest purple. On it lay the body wrapped in crimson. It was followed by his spearmen, the Thracian company and his Germans and Gauls, all in full battle order. The rest of the army led the way, fully armed. The body was borne to Herodian, where it was buried. His golden coffin has never been found. Other questions about Herod's buildings remain unanswered. Where did he find his engineers and architects? How did he pay for his grandiose projects? What is clear is that they led to very little except Herod's self-glorification. In the Christian tradition, he is remembered only as the king who massacred the innocents. And the future of the Jewish people lay in quite other values from those of Herod.